Will you pray with me? Speak to us through your word, holy God. Help to clear away the confusion. Help us to hear with attentive ears and open hearts. And let your gospel be proclaimed to all the world. Amen. What a terrible conundrum the Sadducees have set up for us here. If I were a person who had been widowed and remarried, this text would be very troubling for me. They say we're supposed to be reunited with our spouse in heaven, right? Yeah, isn't that what they say? So what if you have loved and married two people who tragically died before you? Who would you end up with in heaven? How would you choose? That's the terrible conundrum that the Sadducees have presented to us. It leaves us with no way out. In fact, it may even plant a seed of a desperate notion in our minds. Well, maybe it would be better if there was no heaven, because I wouldn't want to have to make that choice. Perhaps it would be better if there was no resurrection. That's exactly what the Sadducees want you to think. They are trying to get you to doubt the resurrection. Because they have a great deal at stake in convincing you that A, the resurrection does not exist, and B, it makes no difference in the world even if it is true. But be careful, this is a trap. And like clever animals in the woods, we have to find out where the trap is, avoid the tempting bait, and trigger to snap on itself without catching us in its deadly grip. Jesus, being the clever brer rabbit that he is, the cunning trickster Bugs Bunny, is going to show us exactly what the Sadducees are up to. Chomping on his carrot and walking nonchalantly around this trap hidden in a pile of words, Jesus shows us that this riddle is not about marriage at all. The Sadducees have posed a puzzle that has nothing to do with marriage actually has to do with protecting their own power and trying to get rid of that meddling trickster rabbi. Let me explain. In Jesus' time, and in some cultures still today, women were viewed as property to be bought and sold. Marriage for them is not the way we understand it. For us, marriage is a mutual relationship between two equal partners who choose each other. But it wasn't like that in Jesus' day. The men of each family would make the decision about the fate of the women, and they bargained with each other over the bride price, the dowry. Once the financial arrangements had been made and the wedding ceremony complete, the wife became the property and the responsibility of the husband. But according to the law given by Moses, he tried to put some protections in place in case for the wife, if the husband did die and there were no children, she'd be left out on the street. So he gave this command that if the man died, she would be married to the brother instead. He was obligated to take her into his home. He had to marry her, and she was now his responsibility. In this twisted scenario, posed to Jesus, however, the Sadducees present a situation where the second brother dies, and she becomes the next brother's wife. And he dies, and she becomes the next brother's wife. And so on, down the line. It's like a bad joke on the Hollywood musical, One Bride for Seven Brothers. Tell us, Jesus, the Sadducees hiss, Whose wife will she be in heaven? Or rather, whose problem will she be in the afterlife? 
You want people to believe in the resurrection, Jesus? You want people to believe in heaven? <laughs> then try to solve this riddle, Jesus. It's like a tense courtroom drama, and everyone gathered around is on the edge of their seat to see if Jesus can answer the riddle. Now, why do you suppose these first century lawyers are posing such a convoluted question to Jesus in the first place? What could possibly be their motivation? Well, all along in the Gospel of Luke, these lawyers have been after Jesus, challenging him, trying to trip him up, trying to expose him as a fraud. And they really think they've got him now. They think they've found the perfect way to get him to admit that the resurrection is either not real or not true. Because if the resurrection is not true, then Jesus is a sham. The trap is set and the jaws are ready to snap shut up that rabbi for good. <clears throat> Will Jesus take the bait? But once again, the lawyers have made one fatal mistake. They think that the realm of the resurrection, what we call heaven, is just going to be a continuation of what we have on earth. They assume that the relationships of power and the systems that they have established in this realm are going to carry over into the next. They assume a continuation of a system where women are considered less than men, where their wealth is considered to be concentrated in their own hands, where the people of their nation or their culture or religion are considered superior to everybody else, and they are permitted to do whatever they wish, no matter who it hurts. And why wouldn't they want this continued arrangement in heaven? It's one that benefits them. They win. They have the power, the money, the authority to make all the decisions. And they'll do anything to keep this rabbi from messing with their cushy gig. But once again, Jesus is too clever for the lawyers. Jesus takes their riddle, their convoluted conundrum, their legal system that confuses everyone and tries to trap people with words and keep them in bondage, Jesus takes it all and flips it around, turns it inside out. Like the trickster turning the tables, Jesus cleverly avoids the trap and it snaps shut, empty of its prey. He teaches them that in God's realm, Women and men are equal. Women will no longer be property to be traded among men. Also, the rich are empty and the hungry are filled in God's realm. The ones who are laughing all the way to the bank, while so many others cry in desperation, will find their accounts emptied and the poor finally having what is owed to them for all their hard work and toil. The resurrection, Jesus teaches them, is not about God blessing the rich and powerful in heaven. It's a God's reversal of the status quo here on earth. And it's about the reign of the elite coming to an end. The rich have stolen and hoarded God's blessings on this earth, teaches Jesus, and God will not allow that to continue. So, who doesn't want a resurrection? The ones who like things exactly the way they are. And they don't want you to believe in the resurrection either. Because then you will challenge the way things are. So far, they've done a pretty good job in confusing people about heaven and making them think that the resurrection has no effect on earth. The philosopher Soren Kierkegaard once walked through a city and asked people a question. Asked them, do you believe in the resurrection? 
the majority said yes. But then he asked, what difference does it make for your life? And almost all of them said, not much. Maybe it gives me comfort thinking about living on a cloud somewhere, being free of pain and worry after I die. Not that this isn't a pleasant and comforting thought, but what Jesus is trying to show is that the resurrection has implications right now. Because Jesus was resurrected, is resurrected, it means that the way things are are already being challenged. The proclamation of Mary and John the Baptist and all the prophets before them and all the prophets that have come after are already having an effect on this realm. The mountains are being made low and the valleys are being lifted up. The twisted and rocky paths are being made straight. The poor are claiming their rights as human beings. Women are claiming their rights as full citizens. Races are claiming their rights as children of God. The Sadducees want desperately for this not to be true. Read the Gospel of Luke when you get home. You'll see. The only thing that they care about is the accumulation of wealth, the amassing of power, and their ability to make decisions for themselves, no matter what the cost to others. Sound a little familiar to the situation we have today? where women are still regarded as less than men in much of the world. And in, even in this country, women earn 75 cents for a man's dollar. Where the wealth of nearly every nation is concentrated into the hands of a few. Where the people of one culture, or religion, or race, or nation, or corporation consider themselves superior to others and give themselves permission to do whatever they wish often using the convoluted conundrum of the legal system to justify their claims and seize what they want. The Sadducees of our times will do anything to confuse you, to keep you quiet, so that they can continue to do as they please. They are trying to convince you that Jesus' resurrection is not real, and it doesn't amount to a hill of beans this side of the afterlife. Don't be fooled. Jesus has already proven the Sadducees wrong. Uncovering the fallacy of their assumptions and their logic and revealing the trap for what it really is. In fact, the trickster Jesus has already tripped the trigger. He has already stepped into the trap. And it wasn't empty. Jesus stepped into that trap himself, knowing full well what he was doing. The Sadducees, together with the scribes and the Pharisees and the Roman government and the military, all the power brokers of their day, thought they had Jesus right where they wanted him on that cross, the most deadly trap of all. They thought that they had taken care of Jesus for the last time on that cross. They thought that they had gotten rid of that meddling, wascally wabi for good. But when the women go to the tomb, expecting to find a corpse, and anoint a dead body, they find that the trap is empty for good. God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jesus, is not the God of the dead. God is the one who is the God of the living. For in God, they are all alive. You too are alive alive. You have been made alive through your baptism into Christ Jesus. You don't have to let yourself get caught up in word puzzles meant to make you doubt the significance of Jesus for your life and for our world. And you don't have to worry about who you're going to spend eternity with. 
The resurrection is so much more than our mortal minds can even imagine. You can be assured of Jesus' promise that you will be like angels and that you are children of God because you are children of the resurrection. Amen.